The goal of this session is to help you find work that allows you to do more of what you like and less of what you don't like. And when it comes to finding work that you enjoy, there's many schools of thought on this. Sometimes it can be just purely chasing your passion, like Charlie Palmer here, who went all in on garlic, or Keith Brony, who just loves translating emojis. But there has been a fair amount of research done on what makes a fulfilling job. 80,000 Hours, who are a career research group in the UK, analysed 60 studies on what makes a fulfilling job. And here's what they came up with. The factors that affect job satisfaction are work that you're good at, getting paid fairly, having supportive colleagues, work that fits your personal life, and being engaged in your work. So let's go through each one of them and figure out what it's going to take for you to find a job that you might just enjoy. First up, work that you are good at. Why do we enjoy work we're good at? Well, the better you are at something, the more control you have over what you do and how you do it. Autonomy is lovely. We love being in control. And the beautiful thing is you can get really good at pretty much everything barring physical limitations. I mean really good. But we've only got so much time in the day. So it can be helpful to figure out what you're already good at and focus on becoming exceptional in that area. Play to your strengths. Double down. And if you're not sure what you're good at, there's a few questions that I recommend you reflect on. Ask yourself what parts of your job come easy. And what comes easy to you doesn't come easy to everyone else. It's just that you do the thing every single day that you start to take it for granted. So really think about this one. When were you most productive in your career? What do people come to you and ask for help with? What are you the go-to guy or the go-to gal for? What activities do you do in your spare time? What have you received recognition for in the past? What do you like best about your work? Think back to the job you have now and any other job you've had in the past. And if you could teach someone something, what would it be? Run through each one of those questions and you're going to find clues for where your talents lie. The next factor in finding fulfilling work is getting paid fairly. And being underpaid and overworked is one of the main causes of job dissatisfaction. So at all times, you have to make sure that you're getting paid fairly. And how you do that? Well, first of all, I recommend talking to industry-specific recruiters a couple of times a year. Even if you have no intention of leaving your job, I strongly recommend you do this because you'll quickly find out, first of all, if you're being underpaid, and second of all, how valuable you are to the market, how in demand you are. So try and talk to as many recruiters as you can. You can also review job listings that have the salary and review local salary calculator websites because the likes of Glassdoor and Payscale.com and Salary.com, a lot of that data is from the US and it's all self-reported. So people like you are sending in their salary data to these websites. So it's not going to be entirely accurate. It will give you a broad idea so a better option would be to review local salary calculator websites. So for example, I live in Ireland and let's say I'm looking for the average salary for construction jobs in Ireland. What I'm going to do is Google salary guides Ireland construction and see what pops up because you'll find organizations who operate in your company who report on salary data and it can just be a little more accurate. And lastly, one of the most effective ways to find out if you're being underpaid is to talk to the people that you work with. And I know salary is a sensitive topic. A lot of us don't feel comfortable speaking about it. But if you do, the conversations can be very fruitful. And I'll give you a few examples. So this lady here in the top left spoke to a colleague who was leaving the company and found out that she was being vastly underpaid. So it can be easier to talk to someone who's leaving the company. They might be just a bit more open to talking about salary. Sarah here found out that her colleague was making 20% less than her, so she then helped her draft up an email for renegotiating her contract. And lastly, this lady here on the right worked for a company that was notorious for underpaying their staff, and she went ahead and got a 7k pay rise for herself and her team members. And when it comes to having these conversations with your coworkers, you don't have to ask outrightly, oh, how much are you on? You can be a bit cute about it and just say, look, 
I've done a bit of research on the average market rates. It turns out that we should be being paid between X and Y. And I'm thinking about asking to be brought up to 50K. What do you reckon? Do you think that's fair? And just see where the conversation goes from there. They might open up with you. It depends what type of relationship you have with your coworker. Of course, if you are close with them, sometimes you can just come out and say, look, I'm earning this. I found out that the market rates are this. So I know I'm being underpaid. And by you opening up and coming clean, they might just do the same with you. Now, when you're discussing your salary with your coworkers, you're not breaking any laws. Unless your contract includes a confidentiality agreement around your salary, legally there's nothing preventing you from talking to your coworkers. And when you do, you can bet your sweet ass that the management are going to get sweaty. Now, of course, if you don't feel comfortable talking about your salary with your coworkers, then try and track down people who work in a similar role at different companies in your industry. And again, you don't have to ask outrightly what they're earning. Keep the conversation light and just say, I'm about to start a job search. I'm looking for a salary package in the range of X and Y. What do you reckon? Does that sound reasonable? And just see what they say. See where the conversation goes. And if you decide to ask your manager for a raise, what I recommend you do the morning before work is a light stretching session. Get those hamstrings nice and loose, then go into the office and head kick your manager straight to the jaw. It, it works well. I've seen it work well. I've used it myself. Just a swift kick and, you know, you're going to get paid. You're going to get your money. Now, if this doesn't work, you can go to my website, paddyjobsman.com, and I have free salary negotiation playbooks that will show you how to go about asking for more money. So best of luck with that. Next up is having supportive colleagues. And we all know that a bad manager, a bad boss can make life hell. I mean, the influence that your manager has on the opportunities that you get, on your happiness, on your mental health, it just can't be understated. So if you are going out there and seeking greener pastures, you need to be able to suss out managers. You need to be able to spot the good from the bad. And there's a few ways that you can go about doing that. The first is to just simply do some research on the company, on your new potential manager. And you can just Google their name and see what pops up. See if they've been on any podcasts, see what they post online, if they're active on LinkedIn, Twitter. And you never know, they might have been involved in a high profile legal case like this lady here who found out her interviewer was suing his kid's high school football coach because the kid wasn't getting enough game time. So nut job, bullet, bullet dodged here. Another good strategy is to see how the company responds to negative reviews. So Gurdev here paid seven sixty for a kebab, hardly any meat, Nan was burnt, and the owner replied, I'm sorry to hear about your Nan. I hope she gets well soon. I mean, this is the type of manager that I want to work for. Doesn't take life too seriously, can have the laugh, can have the crack. I mean, we would get on like a house on fire. So check out those review pages. And when it comes to actually figuring out what it's like to work in the company, if you want to get the real story, you need to talk to people who either work in the company or who have left the company recently. Because yes, you can go to Glassdoor and look up reviews from employees, but I personally know people who have worked for companies and those companies paid their staff to leave positive reviews. So it can be a mixed bag over on Glassdoor. If you go onto the company website, well, their about page, a lot of it is going to be propaganda. The company is only going to make themselves look like angels. So I wouldn't buy into that. And then you have companies who have the great place to work award. And a lot of these awards are bought. And I've personally coached people who have worked at these companies who have won these awards in the last year, in the last two years. And a lot of these department managers are shitty managers. They're tyrants. All it takes is one bad apple to get hired or to get transferred in to make a team's life hell. So see, can you talk to people who are working in the company right now if you have any concerns about the organization? Now, I know that can be quite difficult. So another option is to track down people who have left the company in the last three to six months. And you can do this on LinkedIn. They have a past company filter. So you can type in the company that you want to work for in the past company field. 
and just run through the search results page. See if you can find anyone who's left recently, connect with them, and you can drop them a message that looks like this. Now, what I will say with templates, with using any template, is that a lot of the times they are being used by hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. So only use them as a guide. Never copy them word for word. Make sure you're tweaking them and personalizing them. But essentially what you're saying here is that you've been put forward for a job that the person held in the company and you're just trying to get some insights on the work environment and yeah just ask if they'd be willing to have a chat to discuss what it's like in there and yeah most people won't reply but you only need one person to come back to you to spill the beans. Another way you can suss out bad managers is to ask interview questions that force a genuine answer. So questions like what makes you most proud of your team? What do your best employees say about working here? What do you like about working here? What does the path to grow look like in this role? And do you have any examples of people who have been promoted from within? And when you're listening to the answers that you receive to these questions, how do you know the manager isn't talking a load of brown? Well, they'll contradict themselves or they'll give you vague, generic, cookie cutter answers. They might try and avoid the question or they might get a bit defensive. But one of the biggest telltales is if they aren't able to provide you with specific examples. So trust your instincts. Now, you don't want to make it a war, but if something feels off, ask follow-up questions. Because if you dive into what they're telling you, it's going to be harder for them to keep their story straight if they are filling you with a load of brown. So if they tell you, for example, that someone got a promotion, you know, dive in a little bit. Oh, what did they do to get the promotion? What was the one thing that separated them from the rest of the team? And just carefully analyze how they respond to you. Watch their body language. Listen to the tonality of their voice. Do they sound dead inside or are they filled with enthusiasm and passion? And of course, there are some exceptional liars out there, but go in there like Sherlock Holmes, just so you don't miss any of the subtle red flags. And speaking of which, other red flags to look out for is if the hiring manager pushes blame or doesn't take responsibility, if they're disrespectful, if they're talking smack about either their team members or past colleagues, if they're not prepared, if they're disorganized, if they haven't looked at your resume, if they haven't a clue what you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, if they don't ask many questions, if they're not engaged, if it all feels too easy. Let's say you're on a date and the person gets down on one knee on the first date. There's just, there's something wrong there. There's something off. It shouldn't be that easy. And if they need you to start tomorrow, well, the place might be on fire and people could be leaving in their droves. Now, this isn't an exact science. Sometimes these red flags aren't actually red flags, but they're just things to look out for when you are going through the hiring process. But what I will say is that the hiring process is the honeymoon period. So if you are ill-treated at any point, run. <laughs> Some green flags to look out for. So if the hiring manager is open, transparent, takes full responsibility and ownership for everything, failures, wins, the whole shebang, that's a good sign. If they speak highly about their team and discuss specific accomplishments. If they don't play any games around a salary, at least you know that they're not trying to lowball you. They understand that most of us, we work for money. They outline the hiring process clearly. You're not guessing how many stages there are. Everything is organized. Everything is crystal clear. And there is a clear path for advancing in the company. And if it feels like a conversation rather than an interrogation, that's a sign of a good manager. And of course, they don't pressure you into making a decision if you request a couple of days to make your mind up. They're okay with that. And no matter how well the interview goes, make sure you take some time afterwards to reflect on the conversation. Because if you've been on a job hunt for a while, you can start to get desperate, which means you might get blinded to some of the subtle red flags that are coming up. Now, I understand that maybe you just need a paycheck, you need to get the job desperately, and you're just going to have to ignore all the red flags that you see because you need the money. I get it, but if you are in a position to do so, don't be afraid to tell people no. Don't be afraid to reject a company or an offer because it's easy to fall in love with them. It's easy to get hoodwinked by the company when you need a job. 
So what I will say is try and remain objective because the goal is to make sure that the place you're going to is better than the place where you're coming from. So go into every interview with your eyes wide open. Next up is work that fits your personal life. And a really good question to ponder is what would your perfect workday look like? No matter how far-fetched it sounds to you, map it out, write it down. It could be a four-day work week. It could be that you start your workday at 10 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. It could be having flexi time so you can pick up the kids in the afternoon with no issues. It could be no meetings. It could be working from home. Whatever it is, get it down on paper. Because you'll only get it or get close to it if you know what it is so you can then ask how you can get it. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be possible right now, this second, but at least if you know, you can sit down with your manager, explain what you want, what your goals are, and what you would have to do in order to obtain your perfect workday. What arrangement would you have to come to? What value would you have to add in order to get what you want? So map it out. And Eddie here summarized what my perfect workday would look like. Four hours of focused work, talk to no one, and then just spend the rest of the day floating around, exploring my curiosity, and spending time with my loved ones. And I don't think you can do any more than four hours of focused work per day, and that's with breaks in between, of course. Unless you're really well rested and you're coming back after a holiday, all you can really do is maintenance tasks for the rest of the day. So four hours of focused work is just It's a sweet spot. And the perfect day that I wanted, you know, not talking to anyone, not having meetings, just being alone, getting my shit done. I wasn't able to get that working for someone else. So I had to create my own work. I had to become self-employed. And that might be the case for you, where what you want just isn't going to be an option in your line of work or or in the company that you work with or the companies that you you could be potentially working with. And if that's the case, you might have to go out on your own which I'm going to discuss in a few moments. But that's not to say that crazy shit can happen. So I'll give you a really cool story of a lady who negotiated a three-day work week and she now has a four-day weekend to enjoy with her kids, the ultimate work-life balance. And how she got it, well, when the offer came, she negotiated entirely by email and she included evidence of relevant past success So we're talking here specific achievements and she name dropped well-known clientele. So she really proved that she can perform in this position. She also provided an outline of how she's going to add value from day one, from the get-go. When she gets in that hot seat, what is she going to do? She then referenced that she had multiple job offers on the table. So she let the company know that she was hot stuff, but this organization was her number one choice. And then she threw in her non-negotiables. She said she'll sign right now if the contract can be restructured and she can get a three-day work week. And in the end, the company gave in to her demands. Now, I know this is rare. It might sound far-fetched to you right now, but it does emphasize the point that getting good at what you do, getting really competent will give you negotiating power. It will give you leverage to ask for more of what you want because clearly this woman was very good at what she did. But at the same time, I wanted to include this example to let you know that there are companies out there that will give you your perfect workday. So it can be done. Now, last up is engaging work. Now, let me put a question to you, okay? You have managed to get good at something you probably dislike. So good, in fact, that you get paid for it. But imagine how good you could get at something you like, something you actually care about. For you to be engaged in your work, you need to do more of what you like and less of what you don't like. So it can be helpful to figure that out. And one way you can go about this is just to make a list, like a pros and cons list, On one side, you have all the parts of your job you like. And on the other side, you have all the parts of your job that you hate. So here's what mine looks like. I enjoy being alone and making memes. It's the favorite part of my work. I hate leaving my sitting room, being on LinkedIn, making presentation slides. This was a nightmare to do. And meetings, pointless meetings. So I haven't been able to find anyone who will pay me to be alone and make memes. So... I had to go off 
and set up my own business. But by doing this exercise, by mapping out all the parts of your job you like and dislike, you know what to look out for when you're on your job search. You know what to go for and you know what to avoid. So get crystal clear on what you like and dislike. Another really good way to figure out what you're interested in is the Holland career test. And I know when you do a personality test that they can be hit or miss, but this is very different. It takes about five to 10 minutes to complete and all you're doing is answering multiple choice questions like this one here. Do you like writing books or plays? And you just answer if you like it or dislike it. And the reason why I like this test is because it's accurate, at least for most people. Anytime I've shared it on my social media channels, the feedback I've got is mainly positive. And I did it myself and I was surprised at how accurate my results were. And the beauty of this test is that when you get your results, it will give you a list of careers that match up with what you are interested in. And it will give you a breakdown of each career. So it will tell you all about what the day-to-day -day looks like, what the salary is for the job, what does the future look like for this role. And it will also give you related jobs. So then you can branch off and find even more potential career paths for you. Now, what I will say is that the website that you get redirected to is an American website. So you will have to go off and do your own research on that job in your own country. But it's a great starting point to get the ideas flowing. And there are a number of different Holland career tests online, but I'll leave a link to the one that I use below this video. I've no affiliation at all with this website. This is just the best one that I've come across. Another way you can find work that you're interested in is by typing in the parts of your job that you like into job boards. So you see here, for example, I like making TikTok videos. I threw that in to the LinkedIn search. And the first role that came up was a job where I'd be making TikToks all day. So if you like presenting, if you like training people, throw those keywords into the search bar and see what pops up. And in the search results, then you can find job titles that maybe you didn't think of. And then you can do a bit more research on them. You can see if you know anyone in those roles, you can talk to them, get a feel for the job and see if it tickles your fancy. And another way that you can find out what you're interested in is by asking questions that will spark some ideas for you. For example, what is a subject that you could give a 45 minute presentation on without any prep? Think about that. What did you enjoy doing as a child? And I got asked this question by a massage therapist just before COVID and it ended in a happy ending. Let me explain, get your mind out of the gutter. So. When she was digging into my back, she was like, what, what's going on? Why is your back so crippled? And I was like, I'm spending, you know, eight to 10 hours a day sitting in an office chair. And we got into it, told her I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And then she asked me, what did you enjoy as a child? And I immediately went back to my school days where I would have been 10 or 11. And our teacher let us do sketch shows. So we were able to write these plays and they were all just piss takes and then on Fridays we'd be able to put on a show for the entire school so I remember writing the sketches directing it with all my mates and we had a ball doing it it was serious crack and then the actual acting of the show I mean it was just carnage we had so much fun but the process of writing acting entertaining all of that that got me thinking and then during lockdown, when we were all twiddling our thumbs and I wasn't working, I said to my brother, let's order a green screen and write some sketches and see what happens. And that's what we did. We made a handful of sketches. We dressed up as Garda, as news anchors, milkmen, drug dealers, priests, the whole lot. And we had an absolute ball doing it. But the point of the story here is that doing these sketches gave me the confidence then to go in front of a camera. I had no fear of just recording myself afterwards because I made a holy show of myself in front of everyone. All the people I know, everyone in my neighborhood, all my friends, family members, they all seen these sketches. So there was no going back. I couldn't, there was nothing that could embarrass me more. So I lost that fear. And then that led me to combine what I had experience in with what I enjoyed doing, which was recruitment, helping people get jobs talking about careers and 
that led me to what I'm doing right now. So asking yourself what you did as a child is a really good exercise. It will really reveal what you like to do. So give it a go. Other questions to ask yourself would be, what topics do you go down the YouTube or Wikipedia rabbit hole? Now, God only knows what this kid's after seeing, but that's where your natural curiosity lies. So there's clues in there. Who do you like spending time with? Because if you could solve the problems for the people you enjoy being with, you're going to have a good time. And if you're unhappy in your job, it could be the case that you just don't like the people that you're working with. They're not your people. You would never interact with these people in your personal life. It's only that you need a job, you need a paycheck. That's the only reason you've been put together. And I know we need to play the game. I know we need a paycheck. I understand all of that. But if you are in a position to do so, the next time around, the next time you're looking for a job, go into the interview and just be real. Bring who you are to the interview, the realist version of yourself. And it will help you find your people. And when the weekend is over, you won't have to say goodbye to your true self. Now, if you haven't a clue what you're interested in, it could be the case that you just haven't tried enough things. So as my friend Dominic Joyce always says, try out the career buffet. Dip your toes in lots of different things. If you have an inkling about something that you enjoy, give it a go. I did this with animation. I wanted to make cartoons. So I paid a guy to train me in. And it turns out that making animation on Adobe After Effects is a nightmare. I was like, I don't want to do this. It's too much pain. So I marked it off my list. So now I don't have to wonder. And the beautiful thing is that anything you want to learn is online for free. So test the waters. And when it comes to learning something new, willpower is going to play a major factor in you taking action. It's very difficult to come home after work and let's say you have to make dinner, let's say you have to put the kids to bed or whatever you have to do and then go off and try and learn something new. So what I recommend you do and this is how I started my own business is to break the goal down into smaller chunks. The perfect day is never coming. You're never going to get that three hour block on a Sunday afternoon where no one's going to bother you and you're well rested, you had 10 hours sleep and all the stars align. That day is not coming. So whatever you want to learn, break it down into the most manageable step that you can take, that you can take consistently. And if you put in just 20 minutes per day over an entire year, that's 121 hours. So imagine how far ahead you would be in anything if you put 121 hours into it. So this is my recommendation. Set the alarm clock for an hour before your workday starts. Make yourself a jug of coffee and you'll be full of beans and you can attack what you need to learn full on. Give it the full trust and that will make it more likely then for you to take action and learn what you want to learn. Or at least try or at least test the waters so you can then get closer to figuring out what you want to do. It's also worth trying to upskill at the expense of your employer because this is going to save you money. If you learned a new skill, it's going to give you a competitive advantage. If a promotion comes up, it's going to increase your market value, which increases your job security. And when you're asking, pitch the benefits. Talk about how the skill you develop will help the company either save them money, earn them money, or a combination of both. Now, like I said, what you're looking for in your career or from your job It might not be possible with an employer, so you might have to go out on your own. And there's so many people out there that have turned their hobby into a revenue stream, into an income stream. And a great question to ask yourself to get the ball rolling is, what have you done for so long that people would pay you to coach them on? And I have an example here of a friend of mine, Dean Monks, who is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, And he's been doing it for about eight years. And last year, he started training people in his hometown. Started off with friends, and now it's grown into an established business where he's holding training sessions in his local community center. And he's also now looking for a place of his own. So he's starting to expand. His classes are getting bigger. And this is what Dean does for fun. If he wasn't getting paid, He'd still be doing jiu-jitsu, but now he's offering his services. He's offering his expertise to people in his local area, and he's now working for himself. He's now getting paid to play, and a great statement 
from Alan Watts is for you to figure out some way in which you get paid for playing. Because there's so many people out there right now that are getting paid for playing. Think comedians, think artists, think this fella here, Francis Bourgeois, who is an encyclopedia on trains. And I don't know if you've seen his TikTok videos, but basically he just watches these old school trains go by and he screams about them and he talks about them and he's just in love with trains. And his natural curiosity has led him to getting sponsorship deals, millions of followers online, on social media, and here he is collaborating with Thierry Henry, the footballer. So this is a reminder that if you're good at something and you stick at it and you're consistent, eventually you will become a master at that thing. I mean, that's the only way you can master anything is if you enjoy it. And as a master, you'll then be able to get a good fee for whatever it is that you do, no matter what it is, because there will always be someone who is interested in the things that you're interested in. And to quote Alan Watts again, it's better to have a short life full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And one approach you can take to starting something for yourself is to get a nine to five with minimal responsibility. Now, it's very rare to find a low effort job, but think of jobs that would allow you to save your willpower for the thing you want to build on the side. So one way to go about this is to apply for jobs that you're overqualified for, dumb down your resume so you get interviews, and don't oversell yourself, and then get a job that's easy for you, and this will allow you then to save your energy for what you really want. Other low-stress jobs, think working in a library, a library assistant, working in a museum, maybe a night shift as a security guard. You might have a bit of time on your hands. So start thinking about how you can get a job, a low effort job maybe, or a job with little responsibility or a job that's easy for you. But I have to add in here that even if your job is super easy, if you have a nut job manager, your life is going to be hell. No matter how good you are at your job, no matter how easy it is, it will not be low stress. So when you are looking for a job, make sure you vet your new manager like your Sherlock Holmes. Just run through the strategies that we discussed earlier and that will make it more likely that you avoid nut job managers. And when it comes to making a living for yourself, you don't have to make feckin' millions. It can be as simple as doing a few coaching calls per week. For example, if I was doing career coaching calls at 250 quid and I done three of those calls a week, that's over three grand a month. That's only three calls a week. And there's many coaches out there that are charging 400, 500, 600 euro an hour. People will pay for expertise. If you sell an information product, a digital product, if you made 42 sales of a 99 euro product every month, that's 50k a year. And I'm not saying this is easy. It's it's definitely not. It, it will take a lot of sacrifice. But if it's something you like doing, it beats the hell out of going into a miserable job every day. And when it comes to making a decision, aim at something. Because if you're not aiming at something, you won't even see the opportunities as they arise. But if you have the goal fixated in your mind, as the opportunity comes in on your plate, you see it and you take action. And that brings you closer to getting to your goal. You filter out everything that's not the goal. You have this laser focus. You have a lens on that only sees what will bring you closer to what you want. So definitely, definitely aim at something. There's opportunities everywhere if you are looking. And you'll only see them if you're aiming at them. And if you think it's too late to start, let me remind you that Vlad the Impaler didn't even start impaling people until his mid-30s. It's never too late. Once you are alive, once you are living and breathing, you can take action. It's never too late. Just Google stories of people who started late in their career and ended up being a massive success. Steve Harvey, Ricky Gervais, Samuel L. Jackson, Morgan Freeman. I did this for comedians because I'm 30 and I was like, okay, is it too late for me to start? And when you Google comedians who started late, you'll find people who began in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s. So it really isn't ever too late. It really isn't. Don't let imaginary limitations stop you from taking action. They're not real. They're just made up. And we're all humans. And there's very little between us. You know, there's people that are outliers. There's people that are genetically gifted physically. But for the most part, we're all very similar. 
and there's people out there who are no smarter than you who have exactly what you want right now. So whatever you decide to do with your career, just know you can do it. I wish you the very best of luck with whatever you decide to do next and take care. I'll see you in the next one.